with us on this. So, all right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Talking Trout. I'm Mike Coor with the Wisconsin State Council of Trout Unlimited. Um, happy to have you here on another the first Wednesday of the month. I can't believe it's December already, but um, another month that we can go trout fishing, I guess. So it, it's, the off season goes pretty quick now that we can, now that it opens up January first Saturday in January. So um, it's a nice thing about the trout season here in Wisconsin. Um, We've got a, a pretty exciting guest tonight. You know, we're excited to have Johnson Bridgewater from the the River Alliance of Wisconsin with us. Um, Johnson's been following uh, mining issues um, in the upper Midwest pretty closely for a number of years now. And um, he's really good at working with um, different like watershed groups and and kind of coaching them up on on how to be advocates for their for their watersheds and how to, you know, if you've got like um, you know, mining interest that's coming in to, you know, looking at, you know, putting in a mine in your, in your favorite watershed, you know, how do you react to that? What, what steps can you take or, or how can you have an impact in some of the decisions that need to be made along the way to, to ensure something like that happens, you know, safely and doesn't harm the water. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Johnson. He's got a, a little presentation on on mining in Wisconsin and some of the threats that we face right now are cold water resources. Um, and then, like I said, feel free to drop questions in the chat box and, uh, and we'll make sure we hit them um, uh, towards the end of the evening. So, Johnson, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. And, and thank you, Scott. And I appreciate you all giving me an opportunity to uh, talk to you all tonight. Um, in a moment, I will share my screen, but before I do that, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I've been engaged in uh, conservation and environmental issues for over a couple decades, but most recently, about three years ago, I joined River Alliance of Wisconsin, and I am our statewide water advocates organizer. And essentially what that means is I work with local communities when they have issues that are going to impact water quality um, on the ground wherever they are. We work all across the state. We work on a number of issues, but mining has been by far my my biggest concern here in Wisconsin. And uh, tonight, I hope <laughs> it makes sense. I'll share why that's a big focus, even though um, in general, we don't have a lot of active mining, but I'm going to give a big broad overview tonight about Wisconsin, our region, and then some reasons why it's important that we are um, tracking mining so carefully, especially specific to um, fish. And I am uh, an avid angler. Um, I am a spin caster, you have to forgive me, but I absolutely, I'm in paradise. I'm up near Hurley. So I'm in the northern part of the state and we have some amazing uh, native uh, brook trout creeks here. So I'm a lucky man. And that's a big, big motivator for why I do this work. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here and get this, hopefully get this uh, started and hit the button, hopefully get it into, there we go. Uh, can everybody see, is my uh, presentation showing up? All right. Um, so this is uh, this is a new sticker that we're going to put out, and it's pretty simple. Wisconsin is a water state. My information is on this page, and I would also say, you know, it's it can be hard to pull all of this in in real time, uh, especially through Zoom. That web address there, wisconsinrivers.org forward slash mining. Uh, River Alliance of Wisconsin has a page dedicated to mining and mining issues in Wisconsin. We also have a sign up box on that page where we will send out mining updates as needed. We also provide an update for the quarterly uh, newspaper for the state council. So that's something that you may have read. That's something that I have been doing for a while now. Um, I'm gonna start with the big picture. So this is Lake Superior and what you're looking at there, this is actually the UP, over to the Arrowhead of Minnesota, all the way up uh, to Ontario. The reason that I'm showing you this, they are uh, currently working on a, a wide scale uh, national effort in the United States 
to make mining a, a big part of what they are putting forward as a as a climate solution through EVs and un, other green technologies. Um, so you'll see there the U.S. government's currently proposing to mine our way to climate solution. We're really concerned about this, and I'm calling on you all after tonight to talk to your um, fellow councils in Minnesota and Michigan because of one thing water going forward is going to be more valuable than any other resource or mineral and lake superior uh, if you weren't familiar with this holds 10 percent of the entire world's uh, surface fresh water supply so in one spot we have a tenth of the water's fresh surface water this is really important to think about because wisconsin is in a unique geography we actually drain into two different great lakes and the um the big picture here at the top there so what could happen and i'll i'll get briefly into minnesota and michigan what could happen if this desire to ramp up mining is met by investment and government, we could actually be facing a mining district in our region. So this is why uh, I have been allowed to work closely with Minnesota and Michigan, and we're developing a regional information exchange to share information about mining because there are currently proposals and exploration planned in both Minnesota and the UP uh, in, on a large scale and just point some things out. So this is the UP, uh, Copperwood. They actually have already started site preparation for that. White Pine North is getting ready to start working on uh, permit uh, apprehension. Uh, Back 40 project, which is in both Michigan and uh, if, will impact Wisconsin. And up here, you'll see this Talon Metals, 400,000 acres. So they have actually put 400,000 acres under lease that they're considering massive exploration for nickel mining, and they're actually receiving federal, uh, federal money through the Department of Defense to uh, make that happen. Jump over on our other side. So in Minnesota, I'm not going to read all of this, but those red dots, what that's important is these are also uh, areas that are very much active in exploration and trying to get mining projects off the ground. And the southern one there, the southernmost of those dots, it too has already received federal funding to explore exploration efforts. So when you pu pull this across the region, again, and here's Wisconsin, we're talking about the potential of mining opening up across a wide area. The reason that is important to pay attention to and to push back against is one of the things that has kept Wisconsin fairly well protected is there's not a large mining processing infrastructure. So it's very expensive. Um, essentially, you would have to, as with the flambeau, if you open up a mine, you would most of the time ship all of that ore off to be processed elsewhere. What we're trying to prevent from happening is a widespread mining district opening up because once you get pieces of infrastructure online, it becomes exponentially easier to continue that trend in the area. Um, <clears throat> so when we drill down to Wisconsin, though, uh, I'll give you a brief update. We're actually, in, in terms of on the ground, real-time mining, we're in a good position right now, but we have a lot of active exploration and interest taking place. Um, and I'll, I'll, start, uh, I'll start over here. So there is one company called Greenlight Metals. They're a Canadian company. They're the ones that you may have heard about recently uh, in Marathon County and Taylor County. So it's the reef deposit in Marathon County, uh, the Bend deposit in Taylor County. They were actually making pretty rapid progress in 2022 on starting exploration mining in both Marathon County and Taylor County. Uh, they have also started, so you see down here where it says Jackson County and Swede property, and then a dot above that. They were actually looking at additional places to secure leases to do even more exploration. Um, they're facing financial issues, though, and their projects have essentially come to a halt at the moment. Uh, Marathon County Reef Deposit, it 
uh, th they actually have not even received the documentation at DNR to work on a final approval for that over in Taylor County and the Bend deposit, a little bit different because it's federal forest, but a similar situation. Uh, the Forest Service is waiting on a response from Greenlight Metals before they get the final okay for the exploration over there. So at the moment, the two furthest along exploration projects, Greenlight Metals in Marathon County and Taylor County, those are both stalled at the moment. And we don't, you know, we don't know if they're going to come back online or not. They, the last report we had from the company is that they were facing financial issues. So we wouldn't say that those projects aren't going to happen, but they, they have come to a stop. Um, I want to go all the way over here to, you may have heard of the Back 40 project, which is on the Menominee River on the border with Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, that project, they are now on their third set of owners. It's a company called Gold Resources Corporation out of Colorado. They too are facing um, huge financial obstacles, really bad ones. Um, so it's possible that that company may even fold. They're a full two years behind on even submitting their first round of application materials to Wisconsin or to Michigan Eagle. So that's the short, quick good news is these projects that would directly start making um, impacts on the ground in Wisconsin have all essentially stalled at the moment. Um, I wanted to point though, so this is Flambeau. I'm gonna talk about that. That's in Ladysmith. I'm gonna talk about that here in a minute. Uh, and this is Lynn and Crandon. Um, Crandon is uh, Mole Lake, essentially, and the reason I'm, I'm pointing these two out, these are also examples of the fact that Wisconsin has repeatedly shown it does not want to see sulfide mining at the local level. The Lynn deposit in Oneida County, there was a, there was a referendum in Oneida County. The, the citizens of Oneida County voted to tell the board they did not want to see that site uh, developed. The Crandon deposit was taken up by Mole Lake and a lot of other people. We actually went to celebration about a month ago, the 20th anniversary of this deposit also being taken offline and closed to exploration and mining. So again, the point here is the people of Wisconsin, when they have been faced with these opportunities, the people who actually live in these areas where mining has been um, pursued have repeatedly pushed back and said that they did not want to risk their water quality over um, the, the financial gain uh, of mining. <clears throat> So why should you all here on this call tonight, um, uh, you know, you might say, well, I don't live in any of those areas. What, why should it matter to me? So a couple things about fish and mining. Um, first of all, the Flambeau mine that I pointed to there in Ladysmith, you may have heard uh, mining companies say it is an example of a mine that ran, was closed successfully and is no longer causing pollution absolutely not true. The Flambeau deposit was added to the list of impaired streams in Wisconsin for copper pollution. So we are actually engaged in, they are currently monitoring uh, that stream again this year, and then we will be part of a meeting in 2024 to figure out how to stop the um, toxicity that's flowing into the Flambeau River there from a tributary directly attributed to the Flambeau mine. Uh, if you didn't know this, copper is incredibly toxic to fish. Uh, the bigger, more general, um, uh, the more general issue with mining is sulfate. And again, we're talking about in Wisconsin, all of these proposals are sulfide mines, meaning they're massive sulfide deposits. The number one issue that we would be dealing with is um, acid mine drainage uh, and problem related to that in simple terms are sulfates. Sulfates, once they get into the water, they kick off a number of chemical reactions, again, absolutely toxic to fish communities. Um, and that's, the, the, so this third one, why that's really important, Wisconsin mining proposals, every single one of the proposals that is active right now would 
I'll be allowed to drain directly into a stream or river in Wisconsin. That's the problem we have with mining and water rich areas across the United States and the world actually, mining is the number one polluter of river systems. So that's something that I want everybody to think about. So it's it's particularly to um, stream ecosystems, mining and streams don't <laughs> aren't compatible. And again, across the United States, mining is the single biggest polluter of river systems and the you know, to put it in dollar terms, the gains, and I'll, I'll speak to the economics in a minute, but the bottom line is Wisconsin tourism and recreation economy consistently one of the top three economic systems uh, in Wisconsin every year. We actually just set a new all-time record for tourism and recreation dollars in Wisconsin. That's what we're focused on, not a pie in the sky dream that we know is going to contaminate the water. We want to protect the one resource, our water, that we know absolutely is critical to assure that this economy that we've built our state around can continue into the future. Um, and the last one, the most important one, uh, if you haven't seen this visual, this is Wisconsin. Uh, it is almost more water than land. It's pretty striking when you look at all of Wisconsin's water resources in isolation from north to south, from east to west. Uh, we are absolutely a water state. So when you combine that basic fact with the fact that mining is the number one contaminant of river systems and that mining in water rich environments always pollutes, and I'll share a study in a second about that, it's just not a good fit to try and open up mining operations in a state like Wisconsin. So don't have to read this. Uh, if you go to the River Alliance mining page that I mentioned, the reason I'm sharing this, this is the first page of a new study that came out. This is a study done by Dr. Stephen Emmerman for the state of Minnesota. They are actually working on trying to implement the very mining law that unfortunately Wisconsin lost in 2017. It's called the Prove It First bill. So Dr. Emmerman decided to put uh, a challenge to the pro-mining people and say, hey, you took our law off the books in Wisconsin. They want to open it up in Minnesota. What is it that you, you know, what are you afraid of? So he actually did a study of nine mine sites in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Ontario. All nine of those mine sites, which are sulfide-based mine sites, every single one of them has a consistent record of water pollution. So the bottom line is he took, you know, he put them to the test because they kept saying, well, we can do mining safely. We can do mining cleanly in Wisconsin and Minnesota. The bottom line is when you look at the data and the analysis and all of that, which Dr. Emmerman did, again, there's a link to this study on our website. They cannot find a single mine comparable to the mines that would be um, put online in Minnesota and uh, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan that don't pollute. This includes the Flambeau mine, which I already mentioned, it is actually polluting contrary to what the mining company said, and the Eagle mine. I don't know if you're familiar, but the Eagle mine is the only nickel producing mine in the United States. It's open in the UP. That mine absolutely has a consistent record of violations of water quality. Again, despite the companies pointing to the Eagle Mine as a quote unquote model mine that doesn't contaminate. <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna spend just a moment on Wisconsin's mining law because we did have for a number of years, actually the strongest mining law in the United States. It was called the Prove It First uh, prove it first law and the reason they called it that is there was a clause in Wisconsin that if you were going to open up a mine in Wisconsin you had to be able to share an example of a similar mine that was functioning and in operation without causing contamination. Unfortunately in 2017 
that law was repealed and it was replaced by a law that was essentially written with mining executives uh, and our legislature. And I'm not going to get into the, the details of it. Happy to have that conversation offline. But why I'm sharing this is people need to, to realize the reason we're so concerned about new potential new mining projects in Wisconsin is we have not had to go through the process with this new law. It was passed in 2017. It significantly weakened our old mining law. And these are the just the three biggest um, changes that are problematic and benefit the mining industry. So the first one is it actually imposes um, time deadlines for the completion of environmental studies. So rather than the studies taking the time they need to be done well, they are actually put on a clock and given X number of days to be done. That's a significant change. Um, it removes the old mining law. There was an automatic, what they would call a contested case hearing, meaning once the mine permit had been issued, there was an automatic contested case hearing where the public and interested parties could challenge parts of the mining uh, permit that they felt weren't up to snuff. They took that out of the law. And the biggest one of all, which I just mentioned, is they completely took out the clause uh, about trying to document a, a mine that didn't contaminate or pollute. So the, again, the summary here is Wisconsin mining law since 20. 2017 has been substantially weakened and we're very concerned if a large-scale mine operation got going in Wisconsin the new mining law would favor uh, the mining companies rather than the public and the protection of our waterways. Um, so I'm going to get into something that may seem a little esoteric but we think that this is also a very um, strong justification for being concerned about mining, not only in Wisconsin, but on a regional scale. Um, if you are familiar with the idea of the ceded territories and hunting and gathering rights that the tribes uh, that have been established in the courts for tribes through the various treaties, these uh, include uh, fish and rice, wild rice. Fish and rice we are finding are particularly susceptible to problems with mining. As I mentioned uh, a little while ago, sulfates and fish aren't compatible. Sulfates and wild rice are absolutely not compatible. Minnesota actually has had in place since 1973 a sulfate standard for water quality because they found that the taconite mining in Minnesota was absolutely harming uh, the wild rice populations through sulfates being released. And as I said earlier, the, the proposed types of mining in our area, which would be massive sulfide mines, they would have the exact same impact. So just a little bit more visually to try and hopefully kind of drive home that not only are we our water state, um, so over here on the left, these are called resource waters uh, by the DNR. They carry weight and significance, and most of you on this um, on this presentation tonight might know them because it also happens to be almost all of the trout streams in Wisconsin. The mining pursuits <laughs> line up across these resource waters. So this is again just another quick example of the visually of the incompatibility of where they want to mine, putting that across uh, what are called exceptional and outstanding waters in Wisconsin. And again, this is almost a one to one matchup with some of our best um, trout streams over here on the right side, that visual that's where uh, wild rice occurs. And again, if you did an overlay where these mining interests want to open up in the UP and uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota, it's it's almost a one to one again. So mining operations would be overlapping uh, wild rice treaty resources. And again, just like uh, streams and mining, they're just not compatible. Um, and I won't get down uh, into the specifics below there. Those are just more graphics uh, that get into a little more detail about um, the, the rice lands uh, and, and how they would match up needing protection. 
Um, this is another, just a little more detail. This is from Glyphwick. This actually shows um, highlighted areas are where the wild rice stands uh, that have been documented exist. And again, just another visual example, this just happens to be all across the, the areas that they are wanting to pursue mining. Um, I talked about this a little while ago and I wanted to give, so Mike mentioned at the outset uh, that, you know, part of my job is helping people, you know, what can we do, uh, we, you know, if we hear about something like this. This is a really specific example, but I wanted to share it because I want to empower and, and let all of you know that anybody can challenge a mine. You don't have to have millions of dollars. It basically comes down to a willingness to stand up and have honest discussion with them. So these um, properties down here, it's uh, the town of Cleveland uh, and then the Swede property in Jackson County. Um, one of the things that we do is we will actually meet with landowners and talk to them about the, um, the types of questions they should be asking the mining companies when they come to them for um, lease requests for their land. Um, the town of Cleveland, we work with communities to pass resolutions opposing mining. So there are things that you can do uh, in the early stages of mining pursuits that make a difference. Um, all of this combined, uh, we feel has been a big part of why Greenlight Metals has been so slowed. Uh, you know, two years ago, they swore they'd be breaking ground in, you know, five years or less on mines in Wisconsin. And they are now two years down the road, haven't even started any of their exploration activities. Um, the Crandon celebration, another example, that is a coalition effort to push back. Um, and then again, just to mention the flambeau, contrary to what uh, mine, the mining uh, operators are saying, it is toxic and the people of Lynn, uh, the Lynn referendum in Oneida County was an example again, working with the community to draft a referendum that went to the vote. And that is what River Alliance does. That is a big part of my job is I can't do referendums anymore due to a change in the law, but helping communities raise awareness, education, and uh, push back against mining efforts. Um, so I've shared uh, most of that on the left you, you, uh, is what I have already shared, but I did want to mention, um, I mentioned the back 40 already. The one thing that I, I really wanted to point out is that effort has, uh, it's the coalition to save the Menominee River. That coalition has been active from, uh, well, for years over there. And now they are on their third set of uh, mine owners and the constant community pushback has been a huge challenge to the mining companies coming in and they are literally uh, they're facing financial ruin right now uh, and haven't even submitted a single application to Michigan Eagle to try and open the back 40 so again I'm sharing this just to say believe it or not people coming together as a community and pushing back every step of the way it can absolutely make a difference and wisconsin has been an amazing example of that on on a number of um fronts um so these are these are uh kind of esoteric number two set of es a second set of esoterics but they're absolutely critical to understand and we'll have plenty of time for questions and I'm happy to talk about these offline. Um, the central problem that we are pushing back right now, and I'm proud to say River Alliance of Wisconsin is one of the only uh, environmental organizations openly criticizing uh, the government move to expand EVs. And we get a lot of grief for this. So like you're standing in the way of solving the climate crisis. We want to be very clear that this notion to mine our way to a solution to climate change, it is a false choice. Uh, there's actually going to be a pretty groundbreaking paper coming out. I wanted to share it tonight, but they still haven't cleared it for publication. So the doctor didn't want me to share it. 
they've crunched all of the numbers on the amount of minerals needed uh, if they're going to, you know, pursue this vision of electrified vehicles being everywhere in, in the world. They literally can't produce enough minerals to make that happen. Um, the way I would frame this is they are once again, it's very similar to what happened with um, fracking about a decade ago. They're proposing a market solution to an issue that can't simply be solved by a new market solution uh, is, is the bottom line on on that and some of the specifics on the local level when green light metals came to wisconsin two years ago they were absolutely waving this notion of this this is for american security and independence and they were using terms like critical minerals the fact of the matter is wisconsin does not have substantial deposits of any what they deem critical minerals we have copper most of it is gold, however, and these are not minerals that are part of what they call the, the green mining revolution. They are for-profit mineral pursuits. And what's even worse is all of the owners at this point are out-of-country owners. So Canada, Green Light Metals is out of Canada. Gold Resources is not out of uh, country, but they're in Colorado. And the mines that would come online today that are being proposed in Wisconsin, this is something that's important to understand. The mines that they are proposing would have a one to two decade and two decades would be on the long side lifespan. They would, uh, they would employ a few dozen at most, definitely not hundreds, absolutely not thousands. Again, the owners of these are not Wisconsin-based owners. They are um, a combination of out of country and out of state. And again, the worst part here is contamination left behind for a mine, even if it's only open for a decade. If you went to Flambeau to Ladysmith today, you would see, yeah, you would not see a giant hole there. You would see um, equestrian trails. But if you look closer, you would see giant um, uh, giant ponds and, and channel systems that they have to they had to build and will have to run for decades. So this idea that the flambeau ran, was successful, closed down, and went away, it's not a true story. Uh, and the fact of the matter is they're going to be filtering that water for probably 100 years. Um, and then a smaller box down here, this, if you have heard the term green mining, uh, and greenwashing, I just wanted to point out green mining refers to the idea that we need to mine for certain minerals to help um, the renewable energy industry. So things like solar panels, um, EV batteries, um, uh, wind turbines all require certain minerals. The problem with that is they have already started going to work on nickel free batteries, for example, because they are realizing there is simply not enough minerals in the ground, even if we opened up every deposit in the upper Midwest, we couldn't produce enough minerals to build out this vision uh, that they're calling for through green mining. And it also is important to understand, it does not mean that their mining is green. It doesn't mean they've changed their, um, they have all made claims that there's new technology, et cetera. But again, I just wanna keep pointing back, every single mine that is in operation right now, including the most recent, the Eagle Mine, they are violating water quality standards annually. It isn't cleaner or safer, no matter what they have said. And I will close with, before questions, no sulfide mine in a water-rich environment has been opened that did not contaminate water. I think we'll stop there. And I know that was a whole lot I ran through quickly. I wanted to make sure we had time for discussion. And I did share this presentation with Mike and anybody who wants it um, is welcome uh, to a copy of the presentation. I shared it as a PDF because I know this was a lot, a lot of material coming down in a short amount of time. Well, thank you, Johnson. Appreciate that. I will, I will start with the obvious. Thanks for getting the message that it was blue flannel shirt day. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's probably a couple of other, others of us out there wearing the same, same shirt, but that's always a nice touch to see. Um, 
on a serious note, very serious topic and uh, appreciate you, you know, taking some time and, and kind of enlightening us on, on really where these things are at. Cause I, I think, you know, for us, at least for me personally, like we're all volunteer organization at the state level. Um, it, you hear about these things and they're kind of there for a while. And then like the back 40 is on the front of your mind. And then eventually it moves to the back of your mind because things are kind of quiet. And then something pops up about bend and reef and, you know, there's these deposits and somebody's doing exploratory mining or pull the permit to do that. And, um, or even like in the headwaters of the Wolf river, I think they did some exploratory mining up there, you know, and then it kind of like, it goes quiet because like you said that the way this whole system is set up you know like you've got one company who's got the leasing the rights and they're like going out of business and so they end up selling the rights to somebody else and then the other company kind of comes in and they've got their own priorities but this the you know the the potential for this mine is always there because the minerals are still in the ground so um yeah it's really important that we stay um you know, up to date. And, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to safeguard our waterways, this is definitely an issue that, that we need to be following very, very closely. So um, certainly appreciate that. A um, couple of questions like popped into my head, I guess I'll start there. And if others, uh, if you guys have questions, you know, for Johnson, like I said, feel free to drop them in the chat and, uh, and we can cover them. But um, you know, one of the things that I was wondering about, you know, you mentioned the importance of um, having the infrastructure on the ground to be able to, you know, bring one of these mines, uh, you know, up and active and, and get it going. Um, you know, where is the nearest processing plant or where, like, if they didn't build a processing plant, like, but they put in the back 40 mine or bend or reef or like, where would those, where would all of that material get shipped to to get processed? Yeah, it's actually a great question. And I will say, so this is one of the things that really alarmed us right off the bat. I mentioned the mining district for our region, for Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Greenlight Metals in their sales pitches, and they shared this, we had copies of it. They were proposing Northern Wisconsin to become their regional mining district. That was terrifying to us. Um, but you know, the specific answer to your question, fortunately, we are not currently that. Um, so Eagle, the Eagle mine in the UP, they have a processing location for their nickel. That is, I forgot the number of miles. It's about 30 miles uh, from the Eagle mine, but it is focused right now just on nickel processing. But there is the possibility uh, so there is a new mine. I didn't get into it because it's it's in it's in the UP. But there is a new mine called the Copperwood Mine. They're actually proposing it's right next to Porcupine Mountain State Park. They're actually proposing to open that mine, and that would also be shipped to the processing facility for the Eagle Mine. So, like I said, they can start to accumulate and that makes the cost more effective they're using that as a as a selling point for the copper wood now in wisconsin so flambeau actually shipped all of its ore to canada um, so that's something to stop and think about the money that they made off of flambeau again it definitely made a lot of money for the investors, but they shipped all of that ore uh, to a well-known processing uh, point in Ontario. Uh, and to, to, so currently there is nobody actually on the ground here, but again, proposal wise, they did just recently, there is a rail line that runs from the UP's White Pine North mine all the way over to uh, Superior, Wisconsin. That railroad line was actually just purchased by a company called Watco. It's not in service, but my point here is that is step one of building out infrastructure. And so what my job is, I actually drill down to that level and track these trackage rights. And um, so the, and then on the Minnesota side, the uh, they don't have, so for their sulfide mining that they're proposing, which is nickel product, they're actually proposing to ship that by rail to North Dakota uh, at this point. And because they're, again, they're looking for a place that the 
controls are much less of North Dakota because of the oil boom. They can pretty much do anything they want there. So that's another aspect I didn't get into. They export the ultimate harm by moving the product maybe out of the, the immediate location of the mine, but that doesn't by any any means mean that it is a safe operation. Um, when they talk about the Eagle Mine, they don't they don't tell you what's actually happening at their processing plant. So it's just something, the, and I, I hope that answers your, your question. Um, it does, yeah. Yeah, and it kind of also gets to the point that I was thinking of is that even the, even if they don't build the ultimately process the material here in Wisconsin, like just just the act of digging it, digging the material out of the ground, putting it onto a rail car, you know, it, it like there's sulfides naturally in the earth, right? And that's what that's where the issue comes from is you unearth those sulfides and then the water hits it and as soon as that happens you've got sulfuric acid right and then um essentially is what's what the fear is um and so even if we're not processing it here it's still a, a threat to our waterways for sure so absolutely um, important to note um Scott had a good question he was uh he was wondering how do mining companies go about acquiring the mineral rights for a specific location is there like a market is this like a stock market thing where anybody can yeah. just buy it or yeah so this is is sort of complex but the the fact of the matter is without getting too deep into it um like how can i so these is it like real estate it, it very much is. So we have severed surface and mineral rights in Wisconsin, which means the majority. Uh, and if you didn't know this, you can go check your with your um, with your land records office. The majority of land in Wisconsin does not carry the mineral interest attached to it. It is actually two separate transactions, and this is. This is actually, believe it or not, comes down to us from English land law. Um, and the UP is the same way. So what happened up there, for example, all of the timber companies, they sold, they stripped off all of the trees. Then they went in and then they sold the mineral rights to, to all these different owners. So you could, you could own your home. You could own your pasture. You may not actually uh, have control or own your mineral interests. And a specific example of that is in the, uh, the the reef deposit in Marathon County. That's what's happened there is you can have landowners who own the surface. They may not want to sign a lease for their mineral interests, but there are legal rights to accessing those um, those mineral interests that businesses have through our legal system. So this is a whole separate area that we are actually thinking about um, possibly doing a landowner education project because there are ways you can secure your mineral interests if you don't have them already, but current law makes it really difficult to navigate that. But the bottom line is, yes, think of it as a second, um, I love that, a second real estate system underneath the ground and the, the, the parcel in Taylor County, so the Bend deposit, that is actually a 40 acres of minerals underneath this is what's amazing underneath Schwamagon national forest uh a railroad company it was the sioux line back in the day when the government was like giving land away to try and get these railroads built they still own mineral rights all across the united states that deposit is only possible because that railroad company um they did the the record search realized that these parcels were were still on the books and greenlight actually acquired that 40 acres minerals from this railroad which i i don't even think is functional anymore i think it's if anything it's just a corporation if you will wow <laughs> yeah that's gonna take a minute to set in Did yes. that answer the question scott <laughs> I, I, I answered it yeah. yeah yeah and i'm just as confused now as i was before but uh, no fault of johnson but uh, <laughs> that's right <laughs> yeah that's a, yeah when you when you talk to the um uh, and forgive me, it's been a long day, but when you talk to the, the title companies, you can actually ask them to look at and research your land and say, hey, who, you know, do I actually have, because believe it or not, it is very common for people to realize they don't even have ownership of their own mineral interests. I spent a number of years working in Oklahoma 
where this was absolutely the norm with the oil and gas industry, thousands of landowners, none of them had their mineral rights. And due to eminent domain and other issues, they were basically forced to allow these operations to take place. They were compensated, but this is the whole question, right? Is can you compensate dollars for the integrity and the potential quality of your water and your land? And our answer would be no. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Agree with you. Uh, we agree with you on that one for sure. Um, you made a good point about, you know, just how important clean water is to our outdoor tourism economy, the outdoor recreation economy in Wisconsin. It's it's really when you add it up, it's it's big, big dollars that we're talking about. And and the map, I love the map that you pulled up. I'm going to have to grab that. I've seen the rivers, you know, I guess I've seen each of those pieces, but I've never seen them all put together when you overlap all the lakes and reservoirs, all the rivers, all the wetlands like that. that we really are a water state for sure. So. That was great to see. I appreciate that um, little graphic there. Um, let's see. We kind of covered sulfide mining um, and kind of some of the threats there. Clean water, you know, the prove it first law. I thought you did a great job covering that. That was that was something that I know our organization was pretty involved with when you know at the capital level, and we were working with your organization and a number of partners on on trying to stop that. And unfortunately it just didn't happen. And, um, which is tough, but, um, that was a, that was a tough one. We kind of got, you know, it is what it is. We're going to end up dealing with it now, but, um, yeah, it, it's unfortunate. And, and it's, it's even more unfortunate when you hear about somebody like Minnesota, you know, our, our neighbors right next door saying, Oh, that's a really good idea. Let's do that here. And then we're, we're like the complete opposite mentality here. Like, let's just get rid of this because we don't want to jump through any hoops to do anything. You know, um, one of the other questions I was thinking about, you know, you're talking about the nickel deposits and the importance of this for like um, electric vehicles and the, the car batteries that they're they're trying to build and things like that. Are there, and maybe this might be outside of your area expertise, but do you know, are there other areas of like large nickel deposits that are not in like water rich environments or is just by the nature of the element or the, you know, nickel itself? Is it, is it only found in these water rich areas? Wow. Yeah, that is an awesome question. And the, the latter, you are absolutely right. So unfortunately, the reason that Minnesota and the UP now have literally hundreds of thousands of acres lined up for nickel exploration is because of what you said. And I actually just happened to sit in um, and I won't, you know, I can't do it, but I saw a scientist explain it. And we are literally sitting here some of you may have heard, you know, glaciation, et cetera, but we're sitting here in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan on a rift. That's why we have the oldest rock in some of the oldest exposed rock in the entire world. We're literally sitting at the center of a rift that happened a couple billion years ago. That deposit, so nickel is one of the things that is very common in the outcome of that. So from the UP all the way west to the arrowhead of Minnesota, um, that's why we have literally, so in, in um, and I forgot the name of the, the town, but in the UP, we have the Eagle Mine. It's the only functioning nickel deposit mine in the United States. And so, yeah, to answer your question, that's the issue. We're sitting here on these deposits. And so from, from a use perspective, people are going to say, well, we need that we need that nickel, right? It's part of this thing. The problem is the solution they're posing is very short lived. If you look 10 years ahead, which it could take 10 years to get all of these mines open, they will have moved well past nickel batteries. So the point here is they're pushing this, you know, we have to do this right now. We have to weaken the laws and get these mines open. But the reality is by the time that those things happen and the damage has occurred, we will have had to move on to other solutions because there just simply is not enough product to do what they want. It sounds great. And I am not trying to by any means, you know, completely um, speak negatively about the, um, the government's approach but it has been 
there is now science coming out proving that it sounds like a great idea to mine our way to sustainable energy future but the fact of the matter is we are going to have to figure out some alternative models other than just continuing to make as much stuff but with new products um there's going to have to be a different path taken and people are just reluctant to to talk about that openly sure no that makes sense yeah and it's uh yeah, it's it's an unfortunate conundrum that we that we find ourselves in, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. Like there's there's not an easy answer right now. I mean, if there was a silver bullet, you know, we would be doing it and mass producing it. And you know, this if if it's a huge issue like climate change, right? There's no easy answer. There's no one one thing that we could just all do, and then oh, this is it, and then we kind of you know the world goes on spinning for another you know, however many thousands of years that, you know, without issue, but. Um, yeah. And that's yeah, why, it's so not there. it's not easy. We're pushing people to look say 50 years ahead when sadly, but truly water will absolutely be the most important resource in the, in the world, hands down, nothing will come even close because of unfortunately the way things are lining up. So that's where we're pushing people is, you know, we understand that you want to try and solve this issue, but we have to look past what realistically is going to happen. Even if we make a ton of progress on climate change, water is going to continue to degrade on the path that we're on. So that's, we're, we're trying to get people to understand. And so when we're sitting here in Wisconsin with a reasonably healthy water system, especially compared to if you put all 50 states, that's where we're really putting our effort is to say, hey, look, we we need to you know we need to think longer term and protect what we have and this is something we have that everybody is going to want uh they're already talking about trying to break the you know the great lakes compact so they can put pipelines in so these are realistic conversations they sound crazy and far-fetched but if you've ever been in a resource scarcity situation you will realize they will pull <laughs> out all the stops to correct that and so we want we just want to you know hold on to what we have and hopefully do everything we can to protect it yeah absolutely and i think we could all um you know learn a lesson from the natives native americans a lot of times they talk about when they make their decision process you know they're thinking not just the next generation or the generation after that but seven generations exactly so we're talking like hundreds of years ahead like is the decision that we make now going to be good for them yeah and, and that's really the way we need to look at this you know um long term like you said um i know we could go on and on it's, it's getting close to the top of the hour i think it like to wrap it up, I, I kind of want to ask you one last question though, is we're, I mean, we're all trout and limited folks. We're pretty, you know, we go to bat for our watersheds. Um, can you, as a, as water advocates, can you give us, can you leave us with a piece of advice or, or things to look out for or things to be mindful of or something that we can be doing um, when we do see threats like mining show up in our, in our home waters? Yeah, absolutely. So not to, you know, not that it's, it's just me, uh, I give immense credit. So Dave Bluen with Wisconsin Sierra Club is a big partner of mine. But it's literally as simple as just reaching out to one of the statewide organizations and sharing a concern, even if it may, you know, if you have no certainty about it, because a big part of my job, like I said, I'm monitoring things um, and keeping tabs on these developments, because we don't, want to burn people out we don't send up red flags um you know for the exploration that we noticed in 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 jackson county we're not going to call out the troops we take that that effort and try and manage expectations but i would just say pick up a phone and honestly just reach out to one of the organizations and this is 80 percent of my job is mining in wisconsin and just say hey um, I don't know what this means, but that is what I am here to do. And so Marathon County, that apps that went from zero to 60 in like a week. And it was literally a matter of um, me getting on a phone call and I made five phone calls. And then those five people made five phone calls. And by the end of the week, 
we had all the information we needed and could respond back and it was all based off of just a i don't know if this is you know going to lead to anything but so um just make a phone call don't ever feel shy about that um and separate issue but very similar wolf river in langley county this random effort to open up um the state trail to atvs in the summertime where people love to trout fish it was a phone call that my boss got and was like i don't know if this means anything and now we're launching a very massive public pushback against this effort to open this trail but it's the same idea it just takes a phone call and a little willingness to like not be shy about raising a concern because we don't our organization anyway we try very hard to do things in a calm and, and thoughtful manner and only raise alarms when it's really you know the the threat level is that high but in the meantime we are constantly talking to people and that's what this is about it's relationships and feeling comfortable picking up the phone yeah that's great um i think we'll leave it there tonight um johnson appreciate you coming and, and sharing your knowledge and uh kind of enlightening us on on where a lot of the mining issues stand in wisconsin right now and uh i know i'll be following along a lot closer uh, at least do my best to follow along a lot closer. And, uh, you know, I, it makes me feel good knowing that there's organizations like the River Alliance of Wisconsin out there. And, you know, we do a lot of, of work with, you know, we're in collaboration with folks from the Sierra Club or, you know, folks at Wisconsin Green Fire. And, um, you know, there are a lot of the Nature Conservancy. I mean, it can go Wisconsin Wetlands Association, it just go down the list. And, and, um, it's really great that there there's a community out there of conservation minded organizations like all we all kind of have our little niche but but everybody kind of talks to each other and and when these you know when an important issue arises like we can certainly come together and rally the troops and um and be a voice for for clean water in wisconsin so you guys do an amazing job and i just like that you ended on that word community because this is why i love working in wisconsin i've never felt such a a close-knit network across the state so thank you all for what you do excellent thank you everybody for joining us um for those who couldn't make it live tonight i'll make sure to put this up on youtube so folks can enjoy it in the future and uh um have a great night thanks again thank you